Welcome to our review of Boba Mahjong, a two-player only set collection card game. Before we get to the review, we need to take a moment to thank Sunrise Tornado for sending us a review copy of this game. So Boba Mahjong is a two-player only set collection card game designed by Tate Wu that features cute artwork from Holly Chu, better known online as Tiny Halls. It ends up that this game is part of a series of Mahjong-based games that started with Tian Zhe Q in 2009. This was re-implemented into The Battle of Red Cliffs, a 1-9 to nine version, uh, player version, which Tate Wu designed along with E.R. Burgess. Finally, the game was converted back to a two-player game in its current form of Boba Mahjong. Besides changes to player count, the mechanisms in the game have also changed with each iteration. And I've got to admit, I did not realize this game had that much of a pedigree and heritage before getting to writing up the review. Now, a game of Boba Mahjong takes about half an hour, and it's recommended for ages 10 plus, which I got to say seems a little higher than it needs to be. The concepts here aren't that complex, and there's no reading required. Now, the game originally funded on Kickstarter in 2022, taking two tries to get funded, and was delivered to backers the same year. It is being published by Sunray's Tornado Game Studio, who we know for their trick-taking card game, Macaron, which we previewed back in November of 2020. You should be able to find Boba Mahjong at some local game stores, direct from Sunrise Tornado, or online at stores like Amazon and Game Nerds, where it seems to have a list priced of $11.99 US, which seems pretty reasonable. Now, for a look at what you get with this two-player rummy-style game, check out our Boba Mahjong unboxing video on YouTube. Now, Boba Mahjong comes in a small card box that's just barely larger than the size of the deck that holds all the cards and a very folded up set of instructions. These instructions actually fold out to a full 8.5 by 11 two-sided standard page with clear rules and lots of examples, especially when it comes to final scoring, which is the most complicated part of the game. The cards in Boba Mahjong are of solid quality and just a little bit slippery. They reminded us of print-on-demand style cards from sites like drive Through Cards. And I've got to say, shuffling them many, many times now, they feel great. They've actually loosened up a bit, and they don't seem to be getting damaged at all. Now, the artwork here is very cute, featuring these happy little boba bubbles um, with a number of bubbles matching the number of cards, as well as some full drinks and some artistically drawn toppings. Now, the card number and icon matching the suits is present in opposite corners, which is a bonus, though the text descriptions are not reversed. Yeah, this was a problem for me the first time playing, in particular, the wild card. Yeah. Now, in total, you get cards numbered 0 to 8 in four different suits, as well as 17 topping cards. Along with that, there are two two-sided reference cards. I was happy with the component quality here, uh, especially given the low price point of the game. And I got to say, it was nice to see a card game that wasn't stored in a great big box that's filled with mostly air. Now, it's possibly going to be harder to show it off on the shelf. As you'll notice behind Mo, for those <laughs> watching, it doesn't really stand out, even though it is there on the shelf behind him. Well, now that you know what you get and where this game is coming from, time to move on to an overview of play. So you start by shuffling the deck and creating what's called the mixing pile. This is made of three face-up cards that can't be zeros at the start of the game. Each player then gets a hand of five cards and the deck is placed by the mixing pile where it's now called the supply deck. The player who most recently had a boba drink or the player who last lost a game of boba mahjong becomes the start player. So if you don't drink boba and have never played the game before, you never get to play ever. Pack it up, return it to the store. You just got to make sure someone in your group has done one of those things. So <laughs> on your turn, you start by drawing. Take one of the face-up cards from the mixing pile or two random cards from the supply deck. <laughs> Next, you can draw again, taking one face-up or two random cards. Or you can create up to three sets using the cards in your hands and the mixing piles. Now, a set is made by using exactly three cards either three cards from your hand or two cards from your hand and one from the mixing pile. These cards can be made either of the same matching number or three sequential numbers or three toppings. Now, the toppings can be of any type. Note that suit color does not matter when making sets. That only comes into play during endgame scoring. Mm -hmm. Now, from your completed set of cards, you're going to pick one of those cards to set aside 
which you're going to save for final scoring. You're then going to discard the other two cards. These go into the mixing pile in any order on any stack in any order. So you could put two cards together on top of each other or split them up. After drawing twice or creating up to three sets, you must either discard down to seven cards or draw three if your hand is empty. Mm -hmm. You then activate any topping cards you put aside this turn. Each of these allows you to break the rules in some way. With things like drawing extra cards, sifting through the mixing pile, or forcing your opponent to discard cards, and more. Now, during all this, zero cards are special. They count as a wild card when making a set and can be used as any number. If this carded after making a set, instead of going in the mixing pile, they're removed from the game. Now, if you do save one for scoring, it counts as the number zero now. The game continues going back and forth until one player sets aside their 10th scoring card. The other player gets one more turn, and final scoring starts with the players picking six of their scoring cards to count for final scoring. An interesting thing to note that came up today is if the player who triggered the end loses one of those scoring cards, the game still ends. It doesn't get continued one more round. Once the trigger is hit, you do finish the game. Now, points are awarded for a bunch of different things. Sets of matching numbers, just like when you're making sets. Straights, regardless of color. Matching colors, where the numbers don't matter. The variety of different colors, as well as pairs of ingredients. Now, again, you just need two ingredients. They don't have to be the same ingredient. No, ingredients are not the sets. So there's a different type of card. Now, what's important to note here is that the same card can be used in multiple categories. All cards are used when evaluating each criteria, colors, sets, straights, etc. A little bit like scoring cribbage in that way. Yep. Uh, the player with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, tie, players get to use all of their set-aside scoring cards to score. If there's still a tie, then the player with the fewest set-aside scoring cards wins. If you somehow still tie, you share the victory. In particular, I love the one with the person who collected the fewest cards. So you had the less, least options is the one that wins that tie. I dig that. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. Game's pretty quick to learn. It's fast to play. And I got to say, it's worth playing a couple games in a row and totaling your points between all games in case someone got a lucky hand or whatever. So you play two, three times and then add up all your scores between all the games. See who's the overall winner. With that, let's move on to what we thought of this two player Mahjong game. So personally, I'm always on the lookout for a good two-player game. I love playing two-player games with my wife, as well as some of my friends. It's one of our favorite ways for my wife and I to spend an evening, and I dig having them on hand for bigger board game nights where it's easier to split groups of people off playing different games. So if you have six players, you don't have a six-player game, while two people can go play Balba Mahjong, while the other four can go play a four-player game. Now, in particular, though, for my wife and I, we like two-player games that are highly portable, so we can toss it in my wife's purse or in the glove box of the van, and games that don't take up a lot of table space. And those are great for bringing to a cafe, coffee shop, pub, or brewery. And Boba Mejong fits all of that criteria. Quick to learn, simple to play, but difficult to master set collection game that has really impressed me. Right. With that small footprint and very portable, it's still, while about the size of a deck of cards, has more single game depth than a deck of cards. So as much as people will say, oh, just throw a deck of cards in there, you can get a lot of different games, but you can't necessarily get one game with the kind of depth you get mm -hmm. from this one deck of cards. Especially with two players. That's the thing that really shines. Like, yes, there's a lot of great four player card games. There's not a lot of great two player ones. Unless you got a cribbage board as well. There you go. The cribbage board's way bigger than this deck. Though. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, what I enjoyed the most at first was the system for saving one card out of every set made for scoring. This immediately made me think of Point Salad, and I like this. This isn't quite the same, though, because you're not changing the scoring criteria. Rather, you're selecting cards that are used to fulfill the criteria that's standard for both players. This ends up adding what's basically a tableau building element to what otherwise would just be a game of rummy. Right, and the choice of what you keep is often as much about what you put back, knowing mm -hmm. that your opponent may make use of those cards that you're discarding back into the mixing bowl. Yes, that is the next awesome part of this game. The mixing bowl, the mixing pile system is awesome. The cleverness of this mechanism really isn't 
obvious until you play a couple rounds or at least till the end of the first game. Both the fact you can make sets using a card from the pile as well as your hands and perhaps more importantly, the fact you all your discards go into this pile is what really makes this game work. This system can lead to some really rewarding combos where you make a set of cards out of your hand, then use one of those discarded cards to make another set and then use a card from that second set to complete a third set. And I got to say, that's the most rewarding thing in this game is pulling off three sets in one turn. So if you're making Boba at home, throwing all your leftover and greens into one bowl and then scooping some out is probably not the most appetizing no. way. Probably not. <laughs> so this was the big brain moment for me. Understanding this engine that you could really that you could build really took the game from game from oh yay it's Rummy set collection to oh this is a cool game. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And actually, I think the theme fits here because you are just kind of throwing stuff. And then at the end, you're picking out the six ingredients that work. So I think you might just be mixing everything in the one bowl. Now, while there is a lot to like, there were some aspects of the game I didn't love. And these, every one of them revolves around the scoring system. Now, the biggest problem is picking the six cards to score out of a set of most 10. Uh, technically, I guess it could be more. It could be... 13 could it not no it could be 12 because the game trigger would be on that 10th and you could do three full sets in that turn so you might be doing 13 different cards to pick from six can lead to massive analysis paralysis like not not just a little bit and this is even from players who aren't usually prone to overthinking it because once you get to that end it's all math I've actually had games of this where picking what cards to score and adding them up took longer than playing a round of the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, but I will actually add another issue, and that is the cards themselves. These are a very cute design, but I did notice uh, after looking at them, I decided, hold on a second, I should bring these into our colorblind simulator that we use. Uh, and I did see some potential issues mm -hmm. there. Again, we aren't colorblind, and I only have a simulator to go from, but it's worth noting that you should take a look if you are concerned. There may be potential issues. Uh, but more than Fair. that, they aren't universally invertible. Uh, mm -hmm. So the number and the symbol are in the corner, but some of the other information on those cards isn't there. Uh, yeah. And in most notably, the wild cards. Don't say wild card if you splay your hand in a normal poker style. Um, and as well, the toppings are all the same on the, uh, on the edges and corners, um, and are also non-invertible if you actually look at the card. So until you're used to it, like I, I didn't know at first, you know, we'd done a quick, quick little teach, but we hadn't gone through everything. We just wanted to get down and play. So I knew there was a zero and yeah, obviously there's going to be something special about a zero card, but the fact that it was a wild card while it said it on the card, I didn't see that mm -hmm. because it was hidden in my cards play. See, I think that's totally fair, though. I got to say with the zeros, that, that's a one-time mistake. Once you know zeros are wild, that one's not that bad. The toppings are hard. I don't know what they could have done otherwise because they have detailed rule text on them. So I don't know if maybe they could have come up with some icons well, to represent that, draw even cards. Even have been the different, the picture of the different things. And yeah, fine. You, yeah. Have, to, you have to remember what the text is or, or look at it. But having when you do your poker split, your hand, you know, when you hold out yep. your hand, you can see that there is a difference between this and this. Yes. Yeah, I don't think you can really splay the ingredients. When I play the game, the ingredients go on top and I splay the rest of my cards yeah. just because they're used differently. But I totally get the complaint. Now, the other issue I found with scoring is that the it just wasn't varied enough. The various categories all scored similar points where like um, three of the same color would be worth the same as a three straight. And I noticed various different scoring combinations yielded the exact same point total. Now, I'm assuming this was probably done for balance so that one particular type of set wasn't more valuable than another, which would lead to everyone trying to collect only that type of set. But there was just something about sitting there trying different combinations and getting the same total that just felt off. Like, let's try three of a kind with a run of three. Okay, that gets me X. Okay, how about instead I do a pair and a run of four? Oh, X. Okay, what about two runs of three? No, that's also X. And, and there are some little variations there. It's not like you're always going to get the same score, but it just, it felt off. And I don't know if it was wrong. 
Yeah, and this is why, and I hadn't actually thought of this until we were sitting here talking about this today, but this is where that cribbage idea comes from. It's, you know, 15-1, 15-2, 15-3, 15-3, 21, you know, and you're just doing, going through that same thing. The strange part and the, the big difference, again, from cribbage is the fact that you have to pick the set of scoring cards. Yes. You're not just scoring all of the the cards you have. Yeah. Um, and so I know my first game, I went one way. I said, okay, well, this is what I'm going to score. And then we sort of analyzed it and looked at other options. And what if I'd actually grab this one card over here instead of this card here? And I, personally, I prefer my optimization to be during the game and not in post-game scoring, going back to a discussion we yes. had earlier. Sean prefers to actually optimize his play during the game, not after. Now, my final concern about this game, and note this is a concern, this is not necessarily a problem, is that it's starting to feel a little samey after multiple plays, especially if you play a lot in a row. And I've got to say, it's 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 hard to complain about this because I will admit, one game doesn't feel like enough. Like once I play once, I always kind of feel like, let's play a second round, especially when teaching someone. You need two rounds of this to fully grok how to play. Um, but then this isn't something, I, I don't want to sit down and play Boba Mahjong Knight. I don't want to sit there for an entire evening playing round after round after round. That said, with time between plays, and it doesn't have to be weeks or months, I'm totally willing to pick it back up. I just, I don't want to hit this game too often in one day. And for my wife, I don't think, like for our vacation trips, we're going out to Jack's on the weekend, I'm not going to just pack Boba Mahjong. But I'll totally bring it along with a copy of the Duke and Patchwork to be part of the mix that we use on our game nights. Maybe as a uh, palate cleanser after a few games of point salad. Yeah, totally legit. So overall, I really enjoyed my plays of Boba Mahjong. This is a really solid two-player implementation of classic set collection mechanisms from games like Mahjong and Rummy. The scoring system's unique and engaging, as is the neat ability to use face-up discards when making sets and the way that discard pile is managed. I'm glad to have Boba Mahjong in my toolbox of two-player games. Perfect for playing with friends and family, as well as being a great date night game for at least my wife and I. This seems like a great game for anyone who's a Rummy fan. Rummy of any form, really, from the traditional card game to games like Rummy Cub and all the various versions of Mahjong out there. You get to all the fun making the sets, but don't need a bunch of players mm -hmm. or a bunch of time to play. Now, due to using traditional set collection mechanics, I also think this game would be a good game for non-gamers, especially fans of traditional card games. Now, where I think Balba Mahjong is going to be a hard sell are gamers who like heavier, longer games. Euro gamers aren't going to find enough uh, mechanics here, enough meat, and Amera fans are going to find there's just no real theme integration here. Like, yeah, okay, I guess it's a mixing bowl, and I guess I'm picking six ingredients to go in my cup, but come on, it's it's about as pasted on as you can get. Though I can see some abstract fantasy, ab fantasy, abstract fantasy games. What is that? Now I want to know. Abstract strategy game fans enjoying the scoring system in particular. That whole selecting at the end does kind of have a trying to outplay your opponent, and especially when you notice your opponent's trying to go for a one for one to six and you keep all the fours, right? I think I think the chess player types are going to dig that. Though I do think that scoring system might be the one possible thing that fends off some of those traditional non-gamers, yeah. uh, traditional card gamers. I but indeed, this is very light aside from that scoring, which again, isn't all that bad. It depends on how competitive you're going to be. <laughs> uh, but if that lightness isn't a deal breaker, go for it. So that's it for our look at Boba Mahjong, a two player only set collection card game from Tate Wu, who seems to be on a mission to modernize as many traditional card game mechanics as they can. And all the power to them. I hope you enjoyed this review. I invite you to also check out the written version over at tabletopbellhop.com. And if you appreciate the work that goes into these, consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop.